Matthew 28. And if you didn't know, that's the last chapter of Matthew, verses 18 through 20. And this is Jesus speaking here. And the Bible says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. We're going to talk about the importance of biblical uh, global missions, and that's what we're talking about in all the month of March. And we'll see that missions not only begins, uh, or it's not only around the world, but it begins at home. And we see here in the book of Matthew, we'll be focusing in the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, where we just read. And there's a certain part of the scripture there where Jesus says, all power, and he's speaking about himself, is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And we see here when Jesus declares this, that he's talking about his deity. In other words, he's talking about the power that he has as God himself. And he's demonstrating to us at the same time his sovereign authority. So as we begin to read in verse 18, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, or he said unto the apostles, he's speaking to the disciples, and he tells them the first thing that comes out of his mouth, he says, hey, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. It denotes that Christ is the head of all things to direct all the affairs of the church and in our families. So in other words, as we read this word, we understand that God has not changed. Christ has not changed. He continues to be the same. So if he continues to be the same, then the Bible tells us that he continues to have all power on heaven and in earth. So he is still the head of our families. He's still the head of our marriages, and he should still be the head of each and every one of us. When we say the head, we're talking about governor, the governing part of what we do. This is why when we speak about marriage, we talk about the importance of marriage, of having Jesus Christ as the center of your marriage means to have Jesus Christ as the governing part of the marriage. And at work and in the individual life and between all our families. This is why when if we, go, we, if we were to share, and I know a lot of us may not understand some of our Church of God history, but if we were to share some of our Church of God history, our first general assembly or our first general gathering was in 1906. It was on January 28th. And one of the first things that our forefathers in the church decided that they needed to declare in that assembly was that the church was judicial only. What does that mean? It meant that they, these forefathers and mothers, took the word of God as God's law. And when they said that they were judicial only, it meant that they did not make up the laws. They didn't have the authority to say, this is what we're going to do or this is what we're not going to do. But they said, no, we're ju judicial only. We are to search out the laws that is written in the word of God and begin to practice them. This is why the church was known and continues to be known as a restoration movement. Because you and I are here to try to restore true Christianity. Today we live in a time period where there are many different types of Christianity. And sometimes you and I are, have faced those types of Christianity and automatically we begin to place a judgment in our minds and say, well, if that person is this way, then all Christians are this way. You ever been to a store, like if you go to Walmart or you go to a certain store, and they treat you a certain way, you think the whole store treats you that way, and then you go and you tell your whole family, don't go to that Walmart because they, they treat you bad every time you go in there. Why do you think I like going to Chick-fil-A? What is the same thing you get in Chick-fil-A everywhere you go? The same customer service everywhere. My pleasure. You know, I went to a Chick-fil-A once, and then she said, have a good day, and I said, she didn't say my pleasure. I'm going to have to go to Google 
and put a review on there and say, wait a minute, because you're so used to the same format everywhere you go. That's been the status of Chick-fil-A. That's been the status of, of Publix. So you go to Publix, you say, I, I can't find the hot sauce. And what do they say? Follow me. I'll take you to where the hot sauce is. That's just the way they are. And when we look at the word of God and we look at what Jesus is saying here, he's saying that not only all power is given to him in heaven, but here on earth. So he continues to govern our life. And we're talking about global missions here. Now, after he says this, Jesus looks at them and then he gives them some homework. He says, go ye therefore. I'm going to read it here in the English Standard Version. It says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Then he says, go therefore. He gives us a command. He says, go. This is what I'm telling you. And in that word Greek, in, in the word go ye in Greek means to transfer something to somebody else. You remember when Jesus is praying in the garden at one occasion, and then he begins to pray for the disciples, and he says, I ask you not only to bless them, but to also bless those that will believe in me through their words. Then he says, but not my will be done, but your will. And then when he's on the cross, he says, it is finished. You know, that word, it is finished, was the same word that they used when a debt was closed in the old Roman time. So when Jesus said, it is finished, he said, the debt has been paid. But then Jesus looks to them and he says, but now I'm transferring this to you. And now I'm telling you the way I was sent by the Father to go ye into this earth. Now I'm telling you, go ye. I'm transferring this to you now. Now he's given him, given them authority on his behalf to go where? What does it say? Into all the nations. But it says, go ye therefore, make disciples of all nations. So he transfers this mission to the church. And who is the church? You and I. Flesh and blood. We're the church. So who is Jesus speaking to? He's speaking to us. Well, a lot of people say, well, I, I can't accept the veracity of the word of God because that was given to a group of 12 Jews, and I'm not a Jew. And he said, well, that was given to, to a group of people years ago. That, that don't speak to me. Yes, it does. You see, the Bible was written to, uh, to such a degree that it can answer every single one of our questions that we have today in 2023. It's still good enough for us today. Why do you think the Bible has been um, attacked by so many? Why do you think the Nazis during World War II uh, decided that they wanted to destroy all of this? And, and all these different historical things that have happened, but the Bible continues to be relevant today for us. It's because it speaks to us. So Jesus transfers this to the church, where the church in the root word for go ye comes from the word pirar, which means to experience. So when he's telling the church and he's telling us, go ye therefore and make disciples, he's saying, I want you to experience what I've experienced. And that ever happened to you before? You, you're in a certain situation or you go watch a movie or you go to a certain place and you say, man, what a wonderful time I had. I want somebody else to experience this. And you go and you share with somebody else that experience and they, they, get, they get so excited. They say, well, I want to go too. You're getting me excited with all these words. And the same thing Jesus is saying to us. This is global missions. He's saying, go in there for I transfer this to you. Get excited and tell everybody else to get excited. But how am I going to get excited if I haven't experienced it yet? Hmm? Like that old movie where this young fella is talking to his father. And he's saying, I've tried so much with my wife. He said, I've, I've told her, I've told her I love her, I've done this, I've done that, I've done that. And his father looks at him and he looks up to the cross and he says, look, son. He said, you really cannot demonstrate love, not just to your wife, but everybody else. If you haven't experienced that love, how can you give out something that you don't even have? How can I have somebody else experience the love of Christ if the love of Christ is not in me? There's no way I can give it to somebody else. I can give you an example. Me, I, I, I know Spanish. I know how to speak Spanish. I've experienced Spanish, so I can teach you Spanish. 
But how would it look for us to invite Brother Bobby to give us a Spanish class? Huh? What do you think about that, Brother Bobby? It, it'd be terrible. He'd probably say, tacos, muy bueno, y vaya con Dios. And that's about it. Because he, he hasn't experienced that language yet. It's not in him. So I can't give you something that I don't have. So this is when we go to the scriptures and we find out that what he is saying is that it also begins in us. With us. You want somebody else to change? Who must change first? Me. We must look in the mirror. And now he transfers it to them. And what does this mean? It meant that Jesus was telling them, now I want you as a church to experience what I have experienced. That same power I experienced from the Father, you too will experience it and not only experience it, but Jesus is saying, I want you to live. So when he's telling them, go ye therefore, a lot of people read this scripture and you think, oh, well, it's just talking about the Great Commission. No, he's, there's more to what he's saying here. He's saying, I'm transferring this experience to you and I want you to now transfer this to other disciples and I want them to get excited about what God has done in your life. And a lot of people will say, well, I can't evangelize. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a teacher. But you got the best thing that a preacher and a teacher could have. You got your testimony of what God has done. All you got to do is share with them. Look, say, hey, look, I ain't perfect. But look, God has done this and this in my life. And because of that, I want you to experience that also. Now, he says, make disciples. And then he says, teach all nations. Now, hear the word teach, it doesn't mean just to teach in the sense of what you and I know today. It also meant to disciple. So when he's saying make disciples and teach them, he's saying, hey, make a disciple, teach them, but help them on the way. Just don't say, oh, well, that person got saved and that's about it. No, it takes time. I'll tell you a story. Years ago, when I was 14 years old, we had a neighbor. It was an elderly lady. She was the meanest lady in the whole neighborhood. Oh, man. She was, you stepped on the sidewalk that belonged to the city. It belonged to her, she said. And one day she got the idea of that she was going to invite me and my brother, who had never been gardeners. So I don't know why she looked at these Latinos and thought we were gardeners. She looked at it. She said, I want you to plant some flowers for me. All right. And she paid us money. $20 back in the days would get you a lot of stuff. You remember those days? And uh, we went ahead and we planted it. Well, I don't know how we did it, but we planted those seeds and we left. We just watered them one time and we left. So a few weeks passed by and I'll never forget passing by her house. She said, yo, little boys, look what you've done to my flowers. And I went to look and they were like this all over the place. It was the worst experience. And I thought about this here and I said, oh, this is why Jesus is saying to make disciples. That you have to care for them. If I would have went back to those plants and care for them, make sure they were growing in the right way, make sure they didn't go too much to the right or too much to the left and make sure they stayed straight on the line, then it would have been a different result. And what is Jesus telling us here? Not just individually, but for others that we reach, that we have to take the time to help them. Help them not to stray too much to the left, not to stray too much to the right, but stay in the balanced road. Stay on the old path. The Bible says if you stay on there, that is where you will find peace for and rest for your souls. Straight. And she looked at us and I said, never again will I take up the career of a gardener. And I thought about that. And Jesus says it here. And he's saying it to them in an active voice. He's commanding them not to stay behind, but to actively make disciples, reach people for the Lord. But we go back to the same thing. How can we make a disciple if we haven't taken up that role as a disciple? How can I teach others to love God if I'm struggling with loving God? 
How can I teach others not to doubt if I'm struggling in my doubts? But that's when I turn to God and I say, Lord, this is your battle and not mine. And Jesus is saying not only to go and make disciples, but to teach all nations. Then he says, after you've done that, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He gives them the mandate. But listen to this. I love what this says here. We're going to read this here. He says, Jesus came and spake unto them. I'm reading verse 18. Follow with me. It says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore teach all nations. And he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But then he says something very important. Teaching them to observe half of the things I command. No? What did he say? I just want to make sure you're listening to me. He said what? To observe all things that I have taught or I have commanded you. What did that mean? It meant to guard and keep. The word of God. You remember the psalmist one time said, he said, Lord, I've taken up your word and I have hid it where? In my heart. You know, I was at a conference this past weekend at the Ligonier conference. And yeah, we had, it was about 6,000 people in that place. And they were talking about global missions and something that Brother Nichols said, he's, he's the president of the Reformed Bible College there in, in Sanford, Florida. He said something that just, I had never heard before. They were talking about the importance of having a Bible. How many of you have a Bible in this, in this morning? Or you're borrowing one from us here? Huh? You could take it home. I'm sure that Brother Bobby would be fine with it. Anybody would be fine with it. And he was talking about the importance of the Bible. And he said in China years ago, when the communist regime had taken over, they had prohibited everybody from having a Bible. And if you, if you study Chinese history, something unique about China is this, that when, when Jesus taught on earth, he spoke Aramaic. And that was the language that he spoke. It was, it was a, it's a, it's a Bible language. And in the early 1910, 1920s, missionaries went to China to preach the gospel. And when they got to the mountains of China, the Chinese people told them, hey, we already know what you're talking about. I said, well, how do you know? He said, come, and they showed him there's a monument in China written in Aramaic honoring the missionaries that had come to preach the gospel to them in that language. But then the communists take over, and they said, all Bibles are prohibited. And Brother Nichols was sharing something that impacted me. He said that the Chinese at that time could not get a hold of a Bible. But they remembered that there had been some missionaries that had come to China and that they had buried them after they died, and they had put the Bibles on their bodies. So they went up and they dug up the bodies in the cemeteries of the missionaries to grab a hold of a Bible. <laughs> Look at that. And sometimes we, we're kind of ashamed to carry our Bible with me. Sometimes we say, I don't know what they're going to think about me carrying my Bible or reading in at work or at school. But they went and they dug up these missionaries' bodies and they took the Bibles. And that's all they had was the Bible. Because something had been taught to them to observe all things. Can you imagine the, the passion that these men and women have? And did you know today there's over 30,000 languages that still do not have the Bible translated in their own language? At the Bible Museum in Washington, we have a brother that works with us and he's like Indiana Jones. He has the best job in the world. His job is to travel the world and to go into remote areas to see if the Bible has been translated in their language. And when he finds it, he gets a copy of it and he brings it back to the museum and he moves the language out and he puts on there and he says, this has been translated to their language. But then, then we have 30,000 and many of those are prohibited that if they were to find out that the Bible was translated in their language, it is certain death for those indigenous people. Now, Jesus says to observe, to keep, and to guard all things. What does it mean to keep and to guard all things? To keep and to guard the word of God. This meant to keep and stop the word from escaping. Escaping from where? From our hearts. <coughs> 
escaping from our hearts. And not only that, but that we would observe and protect the word of God. How do you do that? So how do I, how do I protect the word of God? It begins in your own personal life. That's where it begins. It begins in observing the word of God every single day. Make it a habit. Wake up. First thing you ought to do is say what? Thank you, Jesus, because I woke up this morning. Because someone went to sleep last Saturday night, this Saturday night, and didn't wake up this Sunday. They woke up in eternity. In either eternity away from God or eternity with God. But you and I, because of the mercies of God, because he's so merciful, he's such a loving God, that he decided, Nathan, you're going to wake up today, this Sunday. And I woke up. Then he says, to observe all things. But what all things? He says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Not nobody else. So what is the call of global missions is to teach people to observe whose teachings? The teachings of Jesus. Now we, we can look at all these different religions today and we can look at all of these different teachings. And yes, some of them may sound positive. But when it comes down to the truth of the word of God, there is no doubt in my mind that what you and I have today is without error. Now, I'm not talking about just King James translation. Because a lot of people will say, well, it's just the King James translation is without error. No, the word of God is without error. It's the word of God. When Jesus says, I command you, he's talking about two Greek words that show is that first he is saying, teach them the things I have commanded you, and then teach them from the position or place I have put you in. In other words, they were to remain with him in order to teach the people all the things that he had commanded them. There was no way that they could command the people to continue in those teachings if they were separated or apart from Jesus. Now, this didn't mean it was a position as we are under today when it comes to the church or it meant that a position to place him somewhere else, but it meant that he had told them to teach them to observe all things, which ended with understanding that it was not an option, but it was a command by Christ. You and I don't have an option when it comes to teaching people about the word. Christ has commanded us. But you know what the beautiful thing about this commandment is? That when he really does something in this person here, I really don't see it like a command or a homework. I really don't see it as a burden, but you see it as your way of life. Because you can sit down. One brother was saying yesterday, a pastor, he was saying there's, there's a, a rule that I have, and his wife's name is Kayla. He said there's a rule that I have every time that I speak to somebody. It's either about Kayla or Jesus. And that's it. There's nothing else. It's either about her, my wife, or Jesus. Because you're not going to hear anything else. Why? Because that's what God has done in him. Why not let other people know who we were before and how we are today? How we used to act and how we act today. It wasn't because of us. It wasn't because of you. We don't, we don't have the power to change people. Huh? When he saw us in our condition... His mercy was so great for us that he said, Nathan, I know that you're dirty, you're down and out, you're, you're done with life, but you know what? I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to give you a new road, and I'm going to clean you up, and I'm going to get you on your way, and as you walk, I'm going to be there with you walking together, and as long as you decide to have me next to you, I'll be with you all the way. That's the Jesus we serve. He said, I'll be with you all the way. And we'll see this here in this scripture here when we're talking about global missions because Jesus didn't give us a command without expecting that he was going to be with us to help us. I don't tell people or my children do this if I haven't done it first. That's part of leadership. You don't tell other people as a leader to do something if you ain't done it first. 
You teach them, you help them, and you go along with them and help them to grow, and then they do the same thing, and it begins to multiply and multiply, and you begin to see the work of your hands. Now, this was a direct reference. Now, I'm going I'm to go back here. I want you to listen to this. He says, teaching them to observe all things, whatsoever I have commanded you, and then listen to what he says. Lo, I am with you always. You know that there's no S in the King James, right? It says all way. You say, well, wait a minute. Why is there no S on there? And we'll notice why there's no S. But he says, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. Now, again, Jesus is talking about his deity. What does it mean, deity, that he is God? Remember what Jesus told the disciples? They said, they said well, Lord, we ain't seen the Father. He said, how long have I been with you? Do you not understand that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? You've seen the attributes of the Father? You've seen the love of the Father? You've seen the mercy of the Father working through me? Remember John, when he talked about Jesus, he said in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he said all things were created by him and for him. He was the Word. So when, when God the Father said, let there be light, Jesus said, by my Word, let there be light, and it was light. He was there. And he's saying again to us, he's saying here, hey, I'm giving you this commandment, but I'm going to be with you always, everywhere. This was a direct reference to Matthew's gospel in chapter 1, verse 23. Remember when the angel came to little old Mary and he said, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name, what was it? Emmanuel. You know, one thing I love about Christmas, and I'll probably deviate from this topic here real quick, but one thing I love about Christmas is the old-fashioned Christmas play. You remember that Charlie Brown type of old-fashioned Christmas? I just love, some people say, well, you're such an old soul. No, I just love it. And the angel says, look, a son is coming. His name is going to be Emmanuel. And then he gives us the interpretation of the name Emmanuel. And he says, which being interpreted means what? God with us. Listen to that. God with us. And then Jesus is telling them in the book of Matthew, he says, I am going to be with you all way. So in the Greek, the word always is translated into all or everything. So in other words, there's nothing that is missed when Jesus is with us everywhere we go. So Jesus is saying, if you do all things, I am with you everywhere you go. Again, Jesus is telling us here when he says, I'm with you always, he's showing again his deity that he is God. He can be here right now, and he can be in Cleveland at the same time. He's all powerful. Ain't that amazing, the God we serve? Look at the other religions, and you can find the tomb of Buddha. You can find the tomb of all these prophets that they call, but you'll never find the body of Christ in a tomb because he has resurrected. And he said, I will be with you always. The disciples were an example of continuing obedience to Christ's word. And then we see, and we'll see later in the following weeks, what happens when we obey the command of God. You want to see God's blessings on your life? Obey God's word. Try your best. Wait, when you want to speak up, tell the Holy Spirit, Shut me up. We want to hear something and say, Lord, stop me from hearing or seeing, stop me from seeing. And lead me and guide me and be with me. The more you continue to do it, the more you're going to see results in your life. All he wants is for us to be consistent. I would like you for, to rise with me in this morning. Amen.